Welcome back to The Legal Brief, the show where we crush the various legal myths and misinformation surrounding various areas of the gun world. I'm your host, Adam Kraut, and today we're talking about the changes to the ATF firearms transaction record, or as you probably know it, the 4473. And for those of you who never took note, that's the form that you fill out when you're buying a gun. Cleaning a gun stinks, unless you're using Breakthrough Clean's odorless and non-staining solvents and lubricants to tackle your gun cleaning needs. Be sure to check out their military grade solvent, Battle Burn Oil and Grease, or even the HP Pro for extreme conditions. If you asked and your local shop isn't carrying them, head on over to BreakthroughClean.com and use the code TGC10 to get 10% off your order. Don't forget, the ballots for the NRA Board of Directors election are coming out shortly, so be sure to keep your eye out for those. If you have no idea how to vote for me, check out the video we just did on that topic. Now, the new 4473 is to be used by licensees starting January 16th, 2017. The old revision cannot be used after that date as it will be obsolete. We're going to break this down into two parts. Changes that you, the purchaser, will see, and then changes that the licensee will see. So here's the part for the purchaser, or you guys. For those of you who are unsure how to designate your middle initial, the form now gives instructions to put the letters I-O in quotations after that middle initial. And as you probably guessed, I-O stands for initial only. Further, if you have a last name that contains a suffix such as junior, the third, etc., you are to include that after your last name. You'll notice that the old question 13, which was the purchaser's state of residence, no longer exists. That's been consolidated with question two, the purchaser's address, thus eliminating a redundant question. One of the sections that a number of people always missed was answering not only the race, but ethnicity question on the form. The instructions have been clarified that both must be answered. Don't raise it! Yes, the ATF does separate race and ethnicity. Perhaps the biggest changes that you will see on the form as the purchaser are in questions 11 through 13 or that bottom half of the form. Most of the questions which ask if you have been convicted of a crime or engage in some kind of behavior or have some circumstance that would lead you to be a prohibited person are the same. One of these changes is found in question 11E, which asks, are you an unlawful user of or addicted to marijuana or any depressant, stimulant, narcotic drug or any other controlled substance? Sounds familiar, right? The change comes in big bold letters underneath the question, which state, warning, the use or possession of marijuana remains unlawful under federal law, regardless of whether it has been legalized or decriminalized for medicinal or recreational purposes in the state which you reside. Yes, that's right, marijuana still illegal under federal law, regardless of whatever your state says, thus it is still a prohibiting factor from purchasing a gun. A lot of people seem to think this is a new change, as far as its effect, but in all reality, it's just the warning label that they put underneath to clearly denote to people that they cannot purchase a firearm if they are a user of marijuana, as it's still illegal at the federal level. I've included an open letter in the description from 2011 in which ATF addresses marijuana and firearm purchases. The other big change that you'll see comes in question 12 and 13, which used to be 11K through 15 on the old form. ATF consolidated and revised the citizenship and immigration questions to make them easier to follow. Question 12 was often answered incorrectly because people would not read the instructions in question 11L, which stated, if you answer no to this question, do not respond to question 12 and proceed to question 13, resulting in many boxes in question 12 being marked as no. The changes ATF made seemed to make this area flow a little better and easier for people to comprehend. Lastly, the certification language above the part where you sign and date the form was changed for the person purchasing the firearm. As far as the changes the seller of the firearms will notice, in section B, the old alternate documentation box, which was used if the ID did not show the current residence, has been changed to supplemental government issued documentation if the identification document does not show the current residence address. Small change, same function. For those wondering what this did, it clarifies in the description that the supplemental documentation must be government issued. Box 18C has added clarity that if the individual is a non-immigrant alien admitted to the United States, the seller must record the type of documentation showing exception to the prohibition and attach it to the form. There's now also a box for the name of the employee who completed the form. This box is optional and not required, but some licensees may elect to use it. 
The No Nix checkbox for NFA firearms has had its language revised. It now reads, No Nix check was required because a background check was completed during the NFA approval process on the individual who will receive the NFA firearm as reflected on the approved NFA application. This was clearly meant to put it in line with ATF 41F, which now requires background checks for everybody. If you don't know what that is, go check out the video we did on that. Section D has a number of changes as well. They include instructions that the firearm information must be recorded even if it's not transferred, clarifies the recording of the manufacturer and importer of the firearm, reduces the number of firearms able to be recorded on the form itself from 5 to 4, which may have something to do with the spacing on the form itself, adds a checkbox to record that some of the firearms are part of a pawn transaction, adds a checkbox for private party sales, and combine old questions 31 and 32, which relate to the trade name, address, and FFL number. The last change, other than the instruction section, which I'm not going to cover, but I do suggest you go review, is the certification language for the seller. And you can thank me for some of the revision to that language. The changes include certifying that the form was completed at the licensed business premises unless the transaction meets the requirements of 18 U.S.C. 922 subsection C or the gun show exception, and the transaction complies with the state or local laws that are applicable to the firearms business. It also clarifies that unless the transaction has been denied or canceled, the seller certifies that it is his or her belief that it is not unlawful for him or her to sell, deliver, transport, or otherwise dispose of the firearm listed on the form to the person identified in Section A, the part where the purchaser filled it out. Previously, the language had the seller rely on information published in ATF state law and published ordinances which had not been updated since 2011. Interestingly enough, ATF completely ignores one of its own regulations which states that the director shall annually update the book. Funny how that works, right? Hopefully that gives you a better understanding of the new 4473 and what changes were made. If you guys like this episode, you know what to do. Hit that like button and share it around with your friends. Have a question you want answered on the show? Head on over to the legal brief section on theguncollective.com. Be sure to check out my website, adamkraut.com, for more information on my quest to serve you on the NRA Board of Directors. And don't forget to like The Gun Collective on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, Full30, Snapchat, and wherever else you can catch us on social media. And as always, thanks for watching. The shirts worn in today's episode of The Legal Brief have been provided by Patriot Patch. Click the link in the description to learn more.